Good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone, uh, wherever you may be, depending upon where you are geographically. And welcome to uh, the latest uh, webinar from the Open Group. Uh, this one is on Emissions Data Management and the Open Footprint Forum. Just before we get started today, uh, my name is John Mayer, I'm the Open Group's uh, Events Director. And I'd like to take you through a couple of aspects of WebEx in case you haven't used the WebEx platform in the past. Um, the way we're going to communicate today, you have a couple of means of communication. Um, if you wish to talk to us in terms of um, send us messages or send messages to other people who are on this webinar, please use the chat channel. If you look at the lower right hand corner of your screen, you'll see a little speech bubble. If you click on that, that opens up the chat channel and you can tell us where you've come from, what the weather's like, whether you know, you're having a good day, you can discuss anything in that chat channel, you can talk to other attendees on that chat channel. Okay. However, if you wish to send in questions to uh, the panelists today, I would ask you please not to do that in the chat channel, but to use the Q&A channel. Now the Q&A channel is accessed, um, again, to the bottom right hand corner of the screen, to the right of the speech bubble, you'll see three dots in a horizontal row. If you click on that, that opens up some more options. One of those options is the Q&A channel, okay? And if you have any questions for the presenters, please put those in the Q&A channel. Um, that's where we will look for the questions. It's difficult for us to scroll through all the information on the chat channel to find questions. So please keep the questions to the presenters in the Q&A channel. Uh, I should also let you know this session is being recorded. So both the recording and the slide deck will may be made available um, after the event, probably uh, either sometime tomorrow or on Monday of next week. So uh, if you're not uh, gonna be here for the whole of the session, you'll be able to see it on demand after the event's finished. So all that leaves me to do is to hand over to Jim Hightala, who's going to run this uh, session today. Jim is the Open Group's VP of Sustainability and Market Development. Uh, so over to you, please, Jim. Thanks, John, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today we'll be talking just generally about the, the topic of emissions data management and then more specifically about the work that the Open Footprint Forum are doing uh, in that area. So uh, with me today, I have uh, A.J. Vandervoort. Uh, A.J. is from Intertech. He is the co-chair of the Open Footprint Forum. And Dr. Nainish Kuta, uh, also from the Open Footprint Forum. Uh, A.J. and Nainish will be uh, giving a presentation uh, that talks to some of the issues in emissions data management and uh, the work of the Open Footprint Forum. Uh, and then, as John mentioned, we will have a Q&A at the end uh, I'll be fielding those questions and directing them to either AJ or Nadish. Uh, so please, as uh, questions come up during the presentation, uh, put them in the Q&A tab and uh, we'll get to those at the end of the webinar. So uh, without further ado, uh, AJ, I'll hand it over to you and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh... Thank you very much, Jim. Um, hope you can see me. I appreciate it. I will uh, as well share a PowerPoint presentation um, with all the attendees, um, which will come up uh, come up now. Right, as Jim said, I'm the co-chair of the uh, the Open Group. Um, I've been involved probably for about three years now uh, on behalf of Intertech. Intertech is a um, large, one of the oldest companies in the assurance testing, inspection and certification industry. We date him back to 1896 when Thomas and Edison started ETL. Um, but what is the Open Group's Open Footprint Forum? Um, as it states here, the Open Group Open Footprint Forum provides universal data standards across all industries. We're trying to do that by uh, providing a data standard that has been jointly developed and agreed by leading organizations representing the industry, professional services and technology. And if you as an organization or as a software developer uh, have implemented the OFP data standard, then each company 
will then use the same definitions, which means that the carbon values that are being shared by organizations are then better analyzed and more efficiently analyzed. And this allows companies to then focus their time and efforts on using data on the, their initiatives, which are typically decarbonization or commercial application. Now, our strategy is based on the following, that first of all, we have a problem statement, right? The problem is there is a lack of trust in data, be it ESG, sustainability, or carbon footprint, and it needs to change as it impacts investors and the planet. This statement from the Office of International Affairs of the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission um, puts that problem statement right in front of us. So the upcoming mandatory climate disclosure regulations, and I mentioned just a few here, the SEC one, the CSRD one, and the CSA for Canada, should bring some urgency to the matter. Let's dive into the details. To be able to solve this problem, we need to agree on a comprehensive standardized data model for carbon emissions. And to do so, we used the greenhouse gas protocol standard, which has been around since the mid nineties. On the image on the right, you know, you can see that it differentiates between direct and indirect emissions. And then it breaks it down in scopes one, two, and three, with the aim to provide and clarity in order to avoid the so-called double counting. This in the carbon footprint is probably the most complex uh, part that we're talking about, right? So OFP has taken this concept and developed the versatile data standards for carbon accounting, similar to what you do in financial counting, but now we're gonna count carbons, including third party verification by auditors. And why is that required? As regulators are now mandating this. Um, those of you that may have heard that as of two weeks ago, the European Union has now finalized their mandated regulatory requirements and we'll go in more detail uh, in a few slides. That means companies need to have a level of trust in the data in order to influence and improve their sustainability impact. And that trust is increased by having a well-aligned data model whose data can be verified. And that last thing is a very critical part. More on that later. First, let's delve a bit deeper into the topic of standards. because That's what the uh, OFP is all about, or the Open Group. There are various reporting standards, frameworks and alliances. Anybody of you that's here on the call have been involved before. I've just mentioning here about three of them. There is another 20, 30 of those standards, right? Um, but for example, the World's Business Council for Sustainable Development has got a very unique standard for scope three. Then there is, of course, CDP. That's more a, a standard with regarding to raw reporting. And then there is ISSB, which is the International Standard, standard Sustainability Board, which is a sister company of IFRS. But all of them have overlooked the technical details. So all these standards are, it's, it's a lot of documents and you can wade through it, you can start to understand it, but how are we gonna now transform that in something that we can work with, for example, in an IT system, right? Now OFP provides this. This enables companies and technology providers like hyperscalers, ERP software companies, and other ESG tools to use the OFP standard and implement their own way for tracking, managing, and exchanging the data, providing maximum flexibility and extensibility. As you can understand, there are many players in this ecosystem uh, of sustainability or ESG, whatever you call it, right? There are policymakers, there are standard centers, and I've got them at the top, and then at the bottom, I've got the auditors and technology companies, and of course, the corporations. And you see many of them uh, being depicted here. Many of those have already adopted the OFP 
standard, and here is a list of them. These are committed organizations that have already committed to OFP. In total, we have about 288 members, and Nainish will provide more details on how OFP is organized in a few slides. First of all, as I mentioned before, there is a reason why this is urgent, as regulators like the SEC are mandating these climate-related disclosures next to an organization's financials. So now not only do you have to report um, every quarter your 10K according to with a uh, profit and loss or an income statement, you now as well have to report similar but then related to non-financial um, carbon accounting. Right? The timeline slide here shows when the proposed law is expected to be final. The UK is already active and the SEC's final rule is expected this month, or actually next month in October, um, followed by Canada and Europe. And we've heard yesterday that Canada has been delayed probably by a, a couple of months. We expect it more to be either in, in December or early next year. And uh, as I mentioned before, the European uh, ruling, which is called the European Standard, um, Sustainability Reporting Standard is already been adopted as of a couple of weeks ago. Now, based on this ruling, the blue arrow shows when carbon data collection should start. And as you can see here, for example, in the UK, they require five years of historic data once you file in, for example, Q3 2024. So that means you cannot wait. You need to collect that data now. The SEC, however, requires only two years of data. This means when the first filing is due in Q1 2025, you require to report on data from Q1 2023, and that was a couple of quarters ago. Notice well when limited and reasonable assurance is required. This means data quality is not optional. Today, most companies use thousands of spreadsheets as reporting so far has always been voluntary. We have identified over 30 disclosure requirements that are consistent amongst the global sustainability regs that impact the data model. Here is a list of the first eight, for example, periods covered. As I mentioned in the previous slide that the UK requires five years of data, including energy usage performance. Other jurisdictions like China, India, Japan, Korea, and Singapore follow similar guidelines. Now, what does then the data model look like? And first I wanna show you a slide. It is how it fits in a typical enterprise architecture, right? At the highest level, you've got organizations and regulations that drive the data model. And not only regulations related to what actually is happening in your carbon footprint, but as well, what are your plans? What are your scenarios? What are your targets uh, up to 2050, right? When most organizations is trying to become net zero. In the middle, you will find the supply chain partners, as well as the facilities related uh, to the carbon emissions. And at the bottom, the consumption of resources and its emissions and waste. Now, on the right-hand side, you can have, for example, climate data, or you can have um, the open source the data universe for carbon storage. It's called OSDU, right? Which is a, a very important part these days um, as the world is realized that just stopping with um, carbon emissions ain't gonna, ain't gonna happen. So we need to capture it and we need to, uh, to store it. Uh, some, we call it in the data model sinks, right? More of what is on the left-hand side and how we integrate with ERP systems or ESG reporting systems a little bit later. Right. Here is a logical entities overview. I wanted to show this to you because it, it shows how comprehensive it is. There's about five layers behind this, right? 
the heart of the data model are the emission activities, right? And you see that here on the right hand side, it says GHG activity, right? It is either a source or there is sink. And then below that, you see all its calculations, right? Of course, we can work with other calculators, but what is critical in for an auditor is to understand how a particular number has been calculated and have the traceability and transparency of that calculations, right? At the bottom, you find the product carbon footprint. Now, this is something that is relatively new. It was announced by the World Business Council for Sustainability Development, particularly around scope three requirements for product carbon data exchange. That basically means that when you are in the producing products or provide services, customers will start to ask, so what is your product carbon footprint per, for example, batch or per kilogram or per, per unit, right? We even included product life cycle analysis or LCA as it's called in the industry. That means we are ready for the circular economy and a complete data model for all your sustainability needs. That's what we're aiming for, right? Now, this slide shows the multitude of use cases. And, and this is having been involved now for about three years. Every time that we get into a discussion, we these days put up this slide to say, well, what green box are we talking about here? Is it between an asset and a corporate? Or is it between the third party and a corporate? Or is it between the corporate and a regulator or some reporting framework, right? Or the EPA. So it shows the multitude of use cases. OFP is the, is the green part, right? For data exchanges within an organization. And that's in the darker blue. When we're talking about your supply chain or regulators, that is in the lighter blue. And this shows the depth and breadth of OFP. So what else makes OFP unique? And that is its architecture. The model is built, that the model is built on. It is a 21st century architecture with microservices and containerization for AI, IoT, big data or blockchain with an API first approach, including the latest cybersecurity and DevOps environments from the world's largest hyperscalers. With most microservices from Google Open Edition, and you can run that on either an AWS, Azure, or GCP, or on your own uh, cloud environment. We have maximum flexibility for independent software vendors or companies to use it as a platform as a service, or as a software as a service, or business process as a service, and build cool apps on top of an open source OFP. So what about integration and interoperability? Well, there is something unique about Karma data. Most data is already existing in some kind of ERP system and in some form or in thousands of spreadsheets, right? All you need to do is ingest and rich with calculations, consume and deliver to support a full life cycle of data. That is sustainability built in in OFP, be it for analytics, climate risk mitigation, life cycle analysis, carbon offsets, or simply regulatory reporting. And I'm saying simply, it's sometimes not as simple as it, uh, as it looks. You don't need a monolith rigid ERP system with limited integration and interoperability. Even better, the Open Group has delivered this successfully with the standardization of subsurface data in their so-called OSDU platform, right? And OFP is using the same architecture with a different data model for above surface. So what are our deliverables, right? First of all, it's clear documentation of the OFP data model. Second, the data model with supporting APIs that can be embedded within companies and their products. Thirdly, 100% open source and downloadable from GitLab. Available on GCP, AWS, and Azure. And downloadable for anyone. 
our environment is not meant for production runs, right? We are a reference model. And the APIs, of course, will be backwards compatible, right? Um, as I mentioned before, our reference implementation has the same underpinning as the open groups uh, OSU. My last slide, the underpinnings of our OFP strategy are based on three fundamental aspects. Um, we want to stay aligned with key institutions to drive the evolution of the OFP data model. This is a marathon. This is not a sprint. That is quite clear, although a lot of people are sprinting at the moment because they didn't realize uh, the mandatory aspects or how complex it can get. Right. Um, second one is OFP to support the trusted sharing of emissions data across the value chain right? via evergreen APIs. And last but not least, OFP is designed to support all industries as carbon is a global problem. And I'll hand over to Nainish. Nainish. Thanks, AJ. As you can imagine that this um, work cannot be done by just uh, anybody and it requires a team structure. Next slide, please, AJ. We have six teams in the OFP uh, working structure. As you can see, they're outlined here. Team one is the technical implementation and architecture team. They, the purpose is to develop the APIs to support ingestion, extraction, and general sharing of data based on what uh, AJ described earlier. Team two is more about data modeling and data architecture, and they define the data model based on learnings uh, and feedback that we have received. Uh, there's a third team, reporting and assurance. It defines current and future requirements to support regulatory reporting, um, the different entities from different areas, SEC, CSRD, around GHG emissions. Team four, it defines current and future requirements because all these are need to be fed back to team one and two around the data foundation. Team five, it is essentially creating awareness and aligning the model with the latest changes and updating everything. Um, team six, regarding documentation and publication, it creates the documentation to support the publication of the standard. Next slide. We are asking, or we, uh, we prefer participation in open forum, open forum, why? By actively participating, your organization can influence the way these standards are developing. That is very important for us. Um, each insurance, each company has its needs and we would like for those to be represented. We, it would reduce the cost burden of designing and validating your own environmental footprint platform and product sol or solution of your own. And it also avoids being locked into proprietary solutions. Getting maximum value promoted to all areas of your company who may benefit from this, such as stakeholders, which includes business units, technical industry relations, sustainability, and others. Align your products to our standards early. And please join the open group, open footprint LinkedIn group. Next slide. What would you get? The benefits. Standardizing the architecture and the APIs will allow for easier data transfer between companies. As AJ showed before, there were a large multitude of companies ecosystem that's involved. The ecosystem will be increased, will be created for compatible application services and a large market for software developers target. 
by providing an open source reference implementation, it lowers the barrier and eases access for smaller companies, as well as leverages the innovation of many of the software developers. Finally, it reduces the work of each entity involved in collecting data in your supply chain and your value chain for particularly scope three, which is the most onerous um, collection of data uh, for reporting and next purposes. It consists of all the indirect emissions that occur in the value chain, including both upstream and downstream, which means it includes all your suppliers and their suppliers as needed. Next slide. We're asking call to action. We have the data model being developed and it will be ex uh, extended to include the WBSD initiative. Please help us with validating the data model through live examples and use cases. We are currently working on a few use cases. We could always use assistance in, uh, in enhancing those as well as newer use cases. Second, extending the data model to incorporate assurance data elements. We want to make sure that this is uh, available and this most importantly, it meets all the assurance needs by all the providers. Lastly, writing up and publishing the data standard. And join us at the bottom, the link for the group is at the bottom. Next slide. Thank you, and I will pass it back on to AJ. Or Jim. Or Jim. I'm back. Uh, let's see if I can be put as presenter. I can put the last slide up. All right. And uh, so now we'll we'll go to a Q and A. Um, if you have questions and can submit them on the, the Q and A panel, that would be ideal. Uh, first question, uh, I'll direct to either of you, AG. I know you looked a lot at uh, the various regulations. The question is, is the open footprint uh, standard and data model aligned to the CSRD, which is the European uh, Sustainability Regulation? Yes, it is. And, and I think on slide number eight or nine, um, we have probably spent about a year and a half taking the first drafts um, of the, what the CSRD is called ESRS, right? And we've worked on that, we've identified because we wanna be a global standards because there is many global companies. This is not only for the EU, this is well companies that are dealing um, with the European Union, uh, be them in, in, in Asia or be them in, in um, South America or North America. Um, so, the data model is aligned with that. Yeah. Okay, and uh, the next question is also a regulatory question. Does this align with uh, TCFD, which I think is the Task Force for Climate uh, Financial Disclosure? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, many of the frameworks or regulate, re regulators have based their regulations on the TCFD. So being aligned with the various uh, regulations means that we are as well aligned with the TCFD. Okay, and uh, there's one other in that vein as well. Uh, does this align with uh, carbon call uh, or other open data standard initiatives? Well, that's, that is of course, it, 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 the a very critical thing in where we are at the moment. Um, and since we are working um, very intense with the largest um, energy providers, be them um, oil and gas companies or uh, be them uh, utilities, right? Uh, and as well with the, tele te uh, the technology providers, be it Google, be it uh, AWS, be it Microsoft, and then the auditors, I mentioned uh, the big four, 
um, we believe we are very well positioned to um, incorporate a lot of the open data standards that are out there. And of course, there will be some overlap, like always, right? What I've realized after working with this for almost about three years, the critical part is the, the, the transparency at the same time. When you provide transparency, there are certain th things that uh, organizations would like to keep confidential. So there is an enormous amount of effort being put in that the architecture uh, incorporates all that. So we, of course, are happy to work with a lot of other uh, data models. And, you know, that is the 21st century architecture. Um, and uh, if if that is a possibility to work with um, the, the, the car, uh, a certain um, open standard, we'd like to do so. Yeah. Okay. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, uh, can you t either of you talk about when the various deliverables are expected to be, uh, you know, released and made available out into uh, to the broader community? Currently, if you are a member, you can already uh, work. Uh, with the data model and build your applications. Um, we already have some live implementations of members that have uh, tested this environment. It is our plan um, at the end of this year to make it available in the uh, in the open source environment. And uh, right now we've standardized on, on GitLab for that matter. So that is where it will be released. And then there is a whole process. And Jim, maybe you can explain the process of getting involved once it is open source from a certification perspective. Yeah, so uh, once the, the model is put into uh, community GitLab and made, made public, uh, you know, it's available at that point to be used by anybody. Um, the data model snapshot, the actual published documentation for the data model, goes through an open consensus process inside of the open group uh, that takes, uh, you know, it'll take eight to 10 weeks to go from, you know, the forum uh, signing off that the, the work is done through, through to actually being published and uh, voted on by members and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so that's a kind of a parallel thing that will be happening uh, to the actual uh, release of the, the software to GitLab. So that's, uh, you know, in a nutshell, that's, that's our process. Uh, so one other question, and I need maybe you could address this one. Um, sure. uh, the Open Footprint Forum, uh, you know, we've heard that there's some energy use cases uh, and there's technology companies involved. Uh, is the work of the Open Footprint Forum going to be usable by other industries, uh, you know, with other, other needs and requirements. Yes, that is the idea and that is the objective of the open forum. We, of the open forum, we intend and uh, ask for more participation by different industries. As Asia just mentioned, we have some of the large energy suppliers and some of the large software companies. We would certainly uh, appreciate any uh, and all help and information that would be provided. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. And uh, so one final question. Uh, you know, it, 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 I think it's pretty obvious to everybody that fit for this uh, in trying to solve scope three data management issues, but can either of you speak to how it will be used in uh, Scopes one and two as well. AJ, you want to take that question first, and I can add, add on. <laughs> yeah, okay. sorry, can you repeat it, uh, Jim? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, I think it's probably clear to everybody how this solves some problems with relative to scope three, but our uh, members and others anticipated to use this to track their scope one and two emissions. Well, absolutely. As well. Absolutely. Yeah. It, 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 we started with scope and, and one and scope two, um, as most of those that have been involved in this for a while. And scope three has only sort of become a little bit more mature and, and people understand um, how it works, particularly because the WBCSD has been very 
um, active in making sure that this exchange um, within the supply chain is a critical part for the carbon footprint. And the emphasis here on is on footprint, right? But yeah, the, 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 the bulk of scope one and scope two, particularly when you talk about energy companies, that's what they have focused on and are still focusing on uh, for a significant amount of time. I just want to add one thing to what um, Nainish has said and, and those that uh, are on the call and they, you are either in the software business or in the IT sector. We've actually spent quite some time in coming to grips with the so-called embodied emissions. Embodied emissions is, for example, if you would be using AI and you use um, a, maybe a data center to, to, to um, execute your AIs or you have your own environment, right? What is the carbon footprint? And we are in the middle of that use case. It is a very interesting use case. There's a lot of uh, stuff happening uh, almost on a daily basis around this topic. So if there's anybody out there that says, hey, I'd like to get involved, not only by using AI, as I mentioned uh, within the architecture, but as well understanding the footprint of AI, the carbon footprint, um, please uh, sign up or uh, reach out to us. Yeah. And I would just amplify that a little bit to say that uh, you now when it comes to whether it's software development or just uh, carbon emissions from running of a data center, uh, that's a pretty common use case across every industry. Um, and uh, every industry is going to at some point need to, to, and companies in those industries understand, you know, what does that look like for them? And there is a fair amount of work going on inside the forum to uh, to tackle that exact use case and understand, uh, you know, what that looks like. So, um, so one, one final question on the Q&A uh, panel, are there similar or competitive carbon data model standards initiatives uh, out there that we're aware of? And AJ, that's that one part that yeah. go to you. Yeah, when, when it comes to data models, of course, there are many. I, I think uh, what we have been trying to do, and, and, and I think we've been very successful in that, not making it application specific. So this is a generic data model that you can use for exchanging data between various parties, right? And you can build applications on top of it. Most data models that you will find out there are related to, uh, for example, the ERP systems. So, you know, that, that, that is where we differ. This is a generic data model. And second, the assurance framework. If one of the things that we have realized is critical in this is the traceability and being able to work around verified data. Our data model in, incorporates an assurance framework. And uh, if you are interested in that, we still need uh, quite a bit of help with that to make sure that it is aligned with what all the assurance companies um, need to deal with. Because for the next five to 10 years, um, it has already been forecasted that if you are gonna become an auditor in a sustainability um, a project uh, or whatever it is, you will have your, your future guaranteed. And they need tools, they need um, 21st century tools to be able to do it. Because right now, if I would send an auditor to an organization to audit and Intertech does that, right? Um, they have to wait through thousands of spreadsheets, right? Now, that is not a very efficient way of auditing an organization's um, sustainability uh, reporting. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for that. Uh, uh, I don't, I see, <clears throat> I've seen one other question about are links going to be published to the deliverables? And the answer is yes, when they're, you know, when they're made available on a community GitLab, we will uh, uh, make, uh, make folks aware of that and tell them where to, where to go to get the content. So, yeah. Uh, so that's that. Uh, we are recording this session, so this recording will be available probably sometime tomorrow or early next week. Uh, and uh, we thank everybody for your time today. And AJ and Nanish, thank you both for your contribution to the forum. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, yep. and thank, thank you, you all. all. Yep. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Take care.